So hi, everyone. I'm David. And today, I'm going to be talking about Toplitz inverse covariance <clears throat> based clustering of multivariate time series data. And this is joint work with Sagar Vare, Stephen Boyd, and Yuri Leskovich. So all sorts of applications in today's world generate large amounts of time-stamped multivariate observations. Uh, th these observations often come from some sort of sensor, some various type of sensor. So if you consider uh, automobiles, for example, these sensors may measure the velocity of the car, the position of the steering wheel, how, how hard the driver is pushing the gas pedal. Uh, if you consider brain scanners, the MRIs, for example, these sensors may measure which neurons are firing at what part of the brain and when. If you consider wearable sensors, for example, like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, these sensors are measuring the heart rate, the velocity, what, what the user is doing at a given point in time. So once you have the data, a lot of people, sort of naive people, think that that solves all your problems. But that's not the case at all. You have large amounts of unlabeled, unstructured sensor data. It's often high dimensional. You don't, you don't know what's going on and when. You, you don't know interesting regions, interesting sensors. It's high velocity, so it's coming in at a really fast rate. It's evolving. It's dynamic over time. It's heterogeneous coming in from various different data streams. So you need a way to figure out and understand how to take this really large, high-dimensional data set and convert it to something interpretable and understandable. So one really useful thing, and one thing that can provide a lot of value, is breaking down these time series into a sequence of states. So consider, again, uh, wearable sensors. You may have the heart rate. You may have the air intake or the lung capacity. You may have the velocity. So you have a bunch of different sensors giving, recording lots of readings that evolve over time. And what you want to do is you want to break down this large, long time series into some interpretable states. For example, here you could say, I was walking for 15 minutes, then I went for a 30-minute run, then I sat for two hours, and then I ran for 45 minutes. So you want to break down this really complex numerical time series into something understandable and interpretable. Now, the challenge is that these states are not predefined for the most part. If you're dealing with fitness trackers, without predefining what walking looks like, what running looks like, or even that there are a few key states like walking, running, sitting, you, you can't do that unless you have some expertise or some domain knowledge that in all applications is not necessarily the case. So what you need to do instead, in the most general sense, is discover these states in the first place. So in a purely unsupervised way, take a large multivariate time series and discover key states. And simultaneously, while you're discovering these states, split the time series and break it down into a sequential timeline of these states. So this is the problem. It has various, various applications in a variety of different settings. And this is where our solution, our proposed method, comes in. Uh, we present something called Toplitz Inverse Covariance-Based Clustering, or TIC for short. So it takes in a multivariate time series of length t, and it breaks it down into these states. And it does so by assigning each point in time, each multivariate point in time, into one of k different states, or clusters as we call them, where we define each cluster by a simple pattern. Now, we'll get to in a minute how we define these patterns and what they mean. But the key here is that we have something called temporal consistency. So we're assigning each point of this t-length time series to its own cluster. But we want to encourage adjacent points to belong to the same cluster. So for example, if at time 7 and time 9 I know that I am sitting, at time 8 I most likely was sitting as well. I probably didn't go for a one-second run or a one-second jog in that one-second interval. So what this says is if my adjacent neighbors belong to a state, I'm encouraged to belong to that state as well. So what this yields is segments of time or intervals of time where the state of the system remains constant. This is what allows us to break these really long time series into a much shorter sequence of key states. Now, how do we define these states or clusters? So instead of analyzing each point in isolation, we actually analyze and assign each point to a cluster by looking at a short window ending right at that point. And we do so because it provides real context for the data. So the, uh, the case of automobiles, if the instantaneous state of the car is that I'm driving straight at 15 miles an hour, this short window of time, even if it's just a, a tenth or a couple tenths of a second, it can provide context as to am I speeding up to go on a highway 
or am I slowing down because I'm at a red light? So once we have this window, we define each cluster or state by a multi-layer correlation network showing the correlations between the different sensors at that point in time and over that window. Uh, this correlation network is also known as a Markov random field. So what we have is each cluster is defined by its own multi-layer Markov random field. And what these MRFs do is they encode the conditional dependency structure between the sensors. That is, in an MRF, uh, what you have here is, for, for example here, you have three slices or three timestamps, and each node is a sensor recording a value at that timestamp. Then what an edge represents between two sensors is a partial correlation, that is, holding the rest of the, the data constant. If I wiggle one sensor, will the other one likely change at all? And if there's no edge, it shows that these two sensors are conditionally independent given the other readings. So then what you have here is both intra-time and cross-time correlations. So for example, here, the blue slice, the purple slice, and the orange slice, edges within those slices show correlations within sensors, uh, between sensors at the same time. And then these cross-time correlations show that one sensor changing at one time affects another sensor at a future time. So what we do is we define each cluster by one of these states, by one of these Markov random fields. And the key here is that we're, we're actually clustering the time series data based on the correlation structure and structural relationships between the different sensor readings across time. And we're not doing clustering based on distance methods or distance metrics like a lot of existing methods. Uh, for example, dynamic time warping. And we'll see in a little bit how this can actually be really useful and yield some, some interesting and interpretable results. So as an example here, you take a time series of length n, you have n different sensors across t timestamps, and you're just getting a bunch of points x1, x2, all the way up to xt. So what you're doing is you're simultaneously taking each point in time and assigning it to a cluster, for example, cluster a, b, or c here, while at the same time learning the Markov random field, learning the structural correlations that define each cluster in the first place. So this is what it looks like. And here, for example, you can see this window here is the structural correlation of cluster A, and this is the structural correlation of cluster B, and they're two very different structural correlations. And this is how we assign each point based on the correlation structure. As a more concrete example, consider the automobile sensors that I mentioned at the beginning. So let's say you're in the, this quote unquote state of turning your car. What that means when you're about to turn a car is that you're, you're slowing down, so you're pushing the brake, and as you start to slow down, you begin to turn the steering wheel. So as a result, what you'd expect is in the turning state, there's an edge between the brake node or the brake sensor now and the steering wheel sensor in the future. So there's a cross time edge between the brake and the steering wheel. There's a direct relationship that when I push the brake, that means that tells the system I'm, I'm most likely about to turn the steering wheel if I'm in a turning state. Alternatively, if you're at a stopping state, you're going to an intersection and you're slowing down. So it sort of begins to look like a turn in that you're pushing the brake, but instead of the brake causing the steering wheel to change in a future timestamp, when you're stopping at a stoplight, there's actually not any effects between the brake and the steering wheel. So you won't have this cross time edge that we had in the turning state. So how does this problem look formally? It looks like this, where we have two sets of parameters that we're simultaneously trying to optimize. First is P, which is the point assignment of every point in time, every multivariate point to a cluster. And the second are these thetas, which we'll get to what that T is, this toplets constraint in a minute. But it's the cluster parameters that define this Markov random field. So what we're doing is we're simultaneously aiming to achieve three things. First is sparsity in the resulting structural correlation networks. This is sparsity in the theta that shows that we don't want too many edges because this prevents overfitting, it provides interpretability, and it allows us to distinguish between the different clusters without, uh, uh, because otherwise without the sparsity penalty, any noise would yield fully connected or near fully connected networks, which are pretty useless once all the clusters look like that and you can't really use them to understand the state of the system. The second thing we're trying to optimize is this likelihood term. And this says for every point I assign to cluster I here, that, I, that means that the cluster definitions, the cluster parameters, should have 
likely drawn a distribution that we saw in point I. So for example, the points that we assign to a cluster are well founded in the structural network, the structural correlation of that network. And the third thing we try to optimize is this temporal consistency penalty. This is what I talked about before, that if neighboring timestamps are assigned to a given cluster, I should encourage myself to belong to that cluster as well. So here we have three hyperparameters. One is k, the number of clusters. One is lambda, the amount of sparsity that we want in our networks. And one is beta, the uh, temporal consistency. And all three of those you can optimize using something like Bayesian information criteria. Uh, and that's what we did in our experiments, for example. So now, as I mentioned, this, this theta term here that we're trying to solve is the cluster parameters, and we need it to be this T, this block toplets constraint. So what is a block toplets matrix? It looks something like this, where you have A0, A1, and A2 are all sub-matrices. And for example, the diagonal terms of theta i are A0 repeated three times. And then the off diagonals are A1, with the A1 transpose being above the diagonal, and then A2 similarly. And what this yields is a uh, structural correlation network. This is actually known as a, it's an inverse covariance, and this is a well-defined and a well-studied way to define these Markov random fields. And sparsity in the inverse covariance matrix here of the distribution uh, correlates to, or reflects itself as sparsity or edges in the network structure. So here, what we have is this toplets constraint, which enforces time invariance. And what we do is, as you see, for example, there are three A0s repeated three times. Those are the within layer edge structure. So A0 defines the within layer edges. And as you can see, the blue, the purple, and the orange have the same within layer edge structure. A1 then shows the cross time edges across one timestamp. So the edges between the blue and the purple and between the purple and the orange. And again, if you notice, the blue and the purple and purple and orange cross time edges are the same because they're both defined by A1. Similarly, A2 defines the edges between the blue and the orange. And why we do this is it enforces time invariance. That is, we want this cluster, this correlation structure to hold no matter where our window starts and where our window ends because there is this same correlation structure no matter whether you're at the beginning of the window or the end of the window. And this is really useful because if we go back to our running example, you see here cluster B is defined by this, this correlation structure, but that actually holds true for any window in cluster B. So you can see here there are two windows, both defined by the same correlation structure. This is because no matter where you slide the window, the time invariance of the toplets constraint ensures that you have the same correlations between the sensors at that time. So the tick problem is unfortunately highly non-convex. But there's an easy way to approximately solve it globally using a, an approach sim very similar to expectation maximization. So what we do is we alternate between doing two things. First, we assign points to clusters. We hold the cluster parameters constant, and we assign points to clusters in a temporally consistent way. And then next, we, we hold the point assignments constant and update the cluster parameters. So for both of these, the good news is that there's an efficient way to get the globally optimal solution for these two sub-problems, and we alternate until convergence. So the first problem is we hold the cluster assignments constant, and we assign points to clusters in a temporally consistent way. Uh, this is actually a dynamic programming problem where you have t points across the x-axis going needing to belong to k clusters along the y-axis here. And each node or each bubble is the likelihood of a point being assigned to a certain cluster. And how you solve this is actually a dynamic programming problem where you want to find the minimum cost path from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, where if I change cluster assignments, I have a assignment penalty of beta, where if I don't change uh, cluster assignments, I have no penalty. So this can be actually solved in linear time using something known as the Viterbi algorithm. Next, we hold the point assignments constant and we update the cluster parameters. So this says we need to find this sparse inverse covariance. We need to find this Markov random field from points assigned to this Markov random field. Now, in the, the case without the toplets constraint, this is actually a very well-known problem known as the graphical lasso. It's the first line here, the minimize line, which says you want to find a sparse inverse covariance that also likely generated the data. Uh, but the nuance here in our problem is we have this block toplets constraint. So existing graphical lasso solvers do not work. So in the paper, we derive a solution based on the alternating direction method of multipliers, or ADMM, and then we derive closed form solutions for all the subproblems in this to efficiently solve this problem in a scalable way. 
So we implemented Tick. It's available online uh, at this link, and I'll share that link at the end of the talk as well. And then we evaluated our method and compared with other state-of-the-art baselines uh, on various different clustering assignments. And then we measured the F1 score of how we accurately assigned points in time series into the proper clusters. And uh, here we use synthetic data for the experiments because we had a known ground truth. So this is the, uh, the overall outline of our results here. You can see the first two lines are our method. The first one is our original method. The second one is a slight variant without this temporal consistency penalty. And you can see that both of our methods, in particular our original tick method choosing the parameters by Bayesian information criteria, it's completely, very much blows out of the water every other non-tick method. We have at least 41% higher average F1 score across these four different temporal sequences. These temporal sequences are synthetic experiments using randomly generated data and cluster assignments, and we describe the full method in the paper here. So we have average uh, AUC, or F1 score of uh, 0 0.95, 0 0.96, or the other methods which include Gaussian mixture models, different types of dynamic time warping, neural gas, and even the simple k-means algorithm really struggle to properly break down these time series into the proper states, the proper clusters. So the next thing we studied was the robustness, which is how much data do you need to actually break down the time series and understand the true underlying clustering uh, assignments of the data. So as you can see, when you have very little data, none of the results can perform that well. Uh, even our tick method gets, gets pretty poor results with not enough data. But very, very quickly, tick scales up very fast. If you see blue and then the green is actually our method with this slight variation on it as well. And uh, so se severely and significantly faster than any of the other methods, we can really distinguish what the true underlying states and underlying clusters of the time series are. And then what's actually interesting is as you scale to 500 samples per segment and beyond that, our tick method goes all the way to a one F1 square, which means we get pretty much every point correct or within noise and we might get a couple wrong. Well, all the other methods are inherently limit limited around 0 0.8 or so. The next thing we looked at was the network recovery score. So as I said, we're clustering the time series, we're clustering the points based on the structural correlation network between the sensors at that time. So we, learn the, the clustering assignments as well, but we're also learning this network representation structure. And this is something that none of the other existing methods do. Uh, so there's nothing really to compare it against, but we wanted to see, can we accurately recover the networks, the structural correlation networks as well? And as you can see here, we get above 0.8 F1 score on different temporal sequences. So we're getting really pretty good results here, which says that not only can we accurately split the time series into the proper states, the true underlying states, but we can also recover the networks. We can recover the underlying structural characteristics of each state at the same time. In terms of scalability, our solver, as I said, it's available online and we can get 10 million observations, 50 dimensional in 25 minutes. So it scales pretty well to tens of, 10 to tens of millions of, of unknown variables and 50 dimensions are even higher. And with the number of observations, it actually scales linearly. So it's, it's very scalable for most problems in, in today's applications. So the last thing we did was we analyzed a case study here. So as I mentioned, there's uh, automobile sensor data is very common. And we took a one hour driving session from real world automobile sensor data with seven sensors. Uh, the data came in at 10 Hertz and we ran tick. So using BIC, we found that there were five, or BIC estimated that there were five underlying clusters. And then how we interpreted these clusters, because there's no ground truth states here, is we plotted the between the centrality score of each node in each cluster. This is essentially what is the importance of each node in each cluster. So we have five clusters and seven signals, and you can see here what the importance is of each node in each cluster. So then we can try to come up with our own versions of interpretations of these. So the first cluster, you can see the brake pedal is really important. So maybe this has to do with slowing down. The second cluster has a lot of things going on, but in particular, the Y acceleration, the lateral acceleration is really, really high. So maybe this has to do with turning. The third and fourth clusters are only dependent on velocity and gas for variations in the other sensors. So you can assume this is when the car is going straight or speeding up. So these, these are two interpretations of this. And then the last cluster is sort of a little bit of everything where it has some lateral acceleration, some brake pedal, but it's not a sort of a large overwhelming number of either. So maybe this is something like a curvy road. 
So again, these are just our interpretations, but how do you justify and how do you validate that these are accurate? So what we did was we actually plotted these on a real world Google Maps <clears throat> where we looked at the actual turns and real data and we um, found remarkably consistent results where every time a car made a turn, it'd be in the going straight cluster, then it would be in the slowing down cluster, then it would be in the turning cluster, then it'd be speeding up again, and then it'd be in the going straight cluster. And this was remarkably consistent across different turns, across different settings. And again, if the road was really curvy, we'd even get that curvy road cluster, that fifth cluster. Now what's interesting here is actually, this is a right turn on the left-hand side and a left turn on the right-hand side. And for both of them, we assigned this turning cluster, this red cluster, as the same. So this says that in our method, a left turn and a right turn actually look really similar. And why is this? This is because we're clustering based on structural correlations. In both of them, the brake pedal affects the steering wheel. It doesn't matter which direction, the distances are, are not important. They're in opposite directions, but the structural correlation, the, co the relationships between the sensors is constant. So we find interesting things like left turns and right turns are actually viewed very similarly by our tick algorithm. So overall, this is our method, it's a way of discovering states in time series data and simultaneously breaking down that time series into states. And uh, one last thing I, I'll promote, if you find this interesting, uh, I'm giving another talk on a related topic of learning networks from, or time varying networks from time series data uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. in room 200E. So you can find this over there and I'm happy to take any questions.